All right, thank you, Professor. Good afternoon, I'm Laura Roberts, and it gives me great pleasure to talk to you today about the effect of DNS on TOR's anonymity. This is joint work with Benjamin Greshbach, Tobias Pools, Philip Winter, and Nick Beamster. So let me begin by telling you why we started working on this topic in the first place. So TOR is an anonymity network that lets people browse the web anonymously. And TOR is also known as a system that allows users to circumvent government censorship. However, some TOR users end up with pages like this when they browse websites that are blocked in some places. So for example, this happened when a user tried to access adult content with an exit relay located in Indonesia. The situation looks similar with exit relays located in India. Here, the so-called competent authority didn't like the adult content domain name that the user was trying to access, so the authority blocked the site. So this demonstrates that Tor isn't magically transporting users' traffic into uncensored um, territory. So instead, users are still subject to interference at exit relays, and in this case, DNS is being used to conduct this interference. So let me now give you a quick overview of how um, DNS is handled in Tor. So here we have a Tor client on the left, the Tor network in the middle, a DNS resolver on top, and the example.com web server on the right. So the client is going to attempt to resolve the example.com domain name. Recall that DNS traffic is unencrypted, so we cannot have the Tor client ask its DNS resolver about websites it wants to visit over Tor because this would allow the client's ISP, the resolver itself, and other adversaries to learn what websites the client wants to connect to, which defeats the purpose of using Tor. Instead, DNS queries are sent through Tor, just like web traffic, and exit relays are the ones who perform DNS resolution for Tor clients. Before our work, we knew little about what happens once a DNS query is sent through Tor, and what we knew was based on anecdotal evidence. For example, we didn't know what DNS resolvers exit relays were set up to use. We suspected that some performed their own DNS resolution and that some, some used third-party resolvers such as Google's public DNS resolver, but what else was being done? We also didn't know what autonomous systems the DNS queries were traversing. And we didn't know how these mysterious resolvers worked. So as my example at the beginning of the talk showed, the resolved domains aren't always what we expected. So in our work, we wanted to shed some light on the resolution process, and in particular, we wanted to learn how DNS could be used to compromise Tor's anonymity, or Tor users' anonymity. Um, so the first question we wanted to answer is, how exposed are DNS queries? Normally in past traffic correlation studies, researchers have only worried about the TCP traffic traffic coming out of Tor and not the DNS traffic coming out of Tor. And this is because past work has shown that an attacker that can see traffic going into Tor and the TCP traffic coming out of Tor can potentially link the two and figure out what website a Tor user is visiting. So then we were wondering if there are parts of the internet that get to observe DNS traffic that comes out of Tor and not the TCP traffic that comes out of Tor and what the possibilities are for leveraging that traffic. So here's a visualization of what I mean, and we'll go through this diagram together. So we had a computer in AS88, which is Princeton University. From that computer, we fetched the website Baidu.com. Before fetching the website, we needed to resolve the domain name. So our computer ran its own DNS resolver, which means that it did iterative domain name resolution, starting from the DNS root server, and from then on making its way down the DNS delegation path. 
we show all the ASs that were traversed as part of this process. So notice that we traversed four ASs for the web traffic, but 13 for the DNS traffic and 11 of the ASs were traversed only by DNS traffic. To get a better idea of the situation, we repeated the same experiment for the Alexa top 1000 sites. As a result of our experiment, we found that for half of all of the Alexa 1000 websites, DNS only ASs account for 57% or more of all traversed ASs. So getting back to Tor, this means that an exit relay that is set up to do its own resolution exposes revealing DNS traffic to ASs that do not have the opportunity to observe the corresponding TCP traffic. We conclude from this experiment that DNS traffic is exposed to parts of the internet that subsequent web traffic is not, and that means that there is a class of adversary that has been ignored thus far. So we now know that we should probably pay more attention to DNS resolution in Tor. Therefore, the next big question for us was to understand how exit relays are set up to perform DNS resolution. That is, we wondered how many of them are set up to use Google's public resolver versus how many are set up to do their own resolution, et cetera, because this has some, uh, quite some impact on anonymity. To this end, we designed an experiment to answer this question and we took the following steps. Step one, we set up our own DNS server for a website domain that we own. Step two, using our exit map tool, which is a tool that we maintain that can run a networking task over all exit relays, we made each Tor exit relay resolve a subdomain name that was under our control. We gave each exit relay its own unique subdomain name to resolve so that we could tell them apart later. Step three, we inspected our DNS server logs. If an exit relay does its own resolution, then we expected to see its IP address in our log. If it uses a third party resolver, then we expected to see an unrelated IP address in our log. We ran this experiment from September of 2015 to May of 2016, at least once a day. So here are the results of our experiment. In this table, we are showing you the minimum, maximum, and median percentages of DNS requests that the top four most popular resolvers could observe during the eight months of our experiment. In second place, we have exit relays that do their own resolution, and that's what we mean by the word local, and they represent around 12% of queries coming out of Tor on average. And in first place, we have Google's public 8.8.8.8 resolver that sees around one third of DNS queries coming out of Tor on average. At times, this number grew to over 40%, and this finding is significant because it is alarming that one organization is getting to learn so much about Tor users' behavior. So the next question is, how can an attacker leverage DNS queries to identify which websites Tor users are visiting? So we consider a threat model that's somewhere in between end-to-end -end correlation attacks and website fingerprinting attacks. So remember in a traffic correlation attack, the attacker can see ingress Tor traffic and egress Tor TCP traffic, and then he attempts to link the two. In website fingerprinting, the attacker can only see ingress Tor traffic, which is encrypted, and then he uses machine learning on, on it in order to identify the websites the traffic belongs to. In our threat model, we assume that an attacker can see the user's traffic going to its guard, so the ingress traffic. So on this side, the attacker can be um, the user's ISP, some AS on the path, or the guard itself. In our threat model, we also assume that the attacker can see some outgoing DNS queries, so the egress DNS traffic. So the attacker can be an AS on the path or a malicious DNS server. 
The idea is now for the attacker to do a traditional website fingerprinting attack and then augment it with the observed unencrypted DNS traffic in order to improve the results. So to that end, we extended the WAK nearest uh, neighbors classifier from a USENIC security paper in order to come up with our two attacks. They're called close the world attack and high precision attack. In the interest of time, I'll only talk about our high precision attack. Um, in our high precision attack, we accept um, the WAKNN's website classification only if that website was also observed in DNS traffic. And this addition of DNS data makes our attacks more precise. And it turns out that our attacks work very well for unpopular websites. And by unpopular, I mean websites that are lower on the Alexa scale. And this is problematic for dissident websites such as WikiLeaks, et cetera. Finally, we wanted to get a better understanding of how our attack would work at internet scale, and for this we followed a well-established method. So we simulated clients from the five countries that have the most Tor users, and we placed them in the ASs um, of, tho of those five countries' most popular ISPs. Then we simulated their online behavior, similar to Aaron Johnson et al's CCS paper called Users Get Routed, and we made them visit several websites throughout the day. We also used the Tor Path Simulator for Tor Path Selection. Then we ran trace routes for ingress Tor traffic and egress Tor DNS traffic using the RIPE Atlas measurement platform in order to get the ASs that were traversed. And we label a connection as compromised if it traverses the same AS on the ingress and egress side. And what's nice about RIPE Atlas is that they have many measurement probes in the same ASs as Tor relays, so we took advantage of that. Finally, we ran these simulations for four uh, different exit relay DNS configurations in Tor. That is, what if all Tor exit relays were set up to use their ISPs resolvers? Second, what if all Tor exit relays were set up to use Google's 8.8.8.8 public resolver. Third, what if all Tor exit relays were set up to do their own DNS resolution? And fourth, what if all Tor exit relays were set up as they currently are, aka the status quo? So here are the results of our simulations. Um, this diagram compares the safety of our four DNS configurations for the exit relays. So for each configuration, we have our five ISPs in the countries with the most Tor users. Um, distributions leaning to the right are bad. We want them to be as close to zero as possible. So comparing our four DNS configurations, um, local DNS is the least safe one. Again, this is the one where exit relays are set up to perform their own resolution. And this makes sense intuitively because um, these qu queries are going to spread around the internet the most as we saw in that diagram earlier. So all the other configurations look somewhat similar with ISP DNS being the safest, which makes sense because here we're assuming that an exit relay's ISP's resolver is in the same AS as the exit relay. However, these results don't mean that we should send everything over Google or that all relays should use their ISP's resolver. Things are more complicated than that. So to, th to that end, let's discuss a few countermeasures we came up with. Uh, we actually recommend that exit relay operators should avoid using Google's, eight, Google's public resolver so that Google doesn't get to learn so much about Tor users. And instead, we recommend that they should either use the resolvers provided by their ISPs or they should do their own resolution, particularly if the operator's ISP already hosts many other exit relays. For example, some ISPs like OVH host a disproportionate amount of exit relays, and here again, we're gonna have one entity that gets to learn a lot about what Tor users are doing. Furthermore, exit relays that are set up to do their own resolution can be further configured to minimize DNS information leakage by enabling query name minimization, and with queue name minimization, DNS servers that are higher up in the hierarchy only receive the information they need to know to reply to the request, and not the fully qualified uh, domain name. 
for example, if we wanted to resolve www.example.com, we can ask the root name server where .com is located versus asking it where www.example.com is. So long-term solutions include adding confidentiality to DNS. Uh, for example, TDNS um, transports the DNS protocol over TLS and TCP. Uh, deploying defenses against website fingerprinting attacks should be an important long-term goal too. So now you know how DNS can be used to compromise Tor and what to do about it. Uh, the contributions of our paper are that we discovered that DNS exposes Tor users' behavior to more adversaries than previously thought, that we discovered that Google gets to learn a lot about Tor users' online activity, um, that we created proof of concept de-anonymization attacks that demonstrate how DNS can make uh, website fingerprinting attacks more precise. Um, and that we perform simulations at internet scale in order to understand how our attacks could affect real people. Ultimately, we learned that the nature of today's DNS presents additional opportunities for toward de-anonymization and our work compels researchers to continue exploring how to make DNS more secure. Uh, the moral of the story is that when you build a system like Tor, you have to look at the surrounding technologies um, that it uses because they won't necessarily adhere to your system's security and privacy rules. So here's our project website where you can find our paper, uh, data, code, and replication instructions. I definitely encourage you to check out our paper because it's chock full of information that I didn't have time to touch on um, here. Uh, please feel free to contact me or any of my teammates and I look forward to taking your questions now.